नमस्कार बैंगलूर सो इट्स अ ह्यूज इवेंट थैंक यू सी एन सी एफ फॉर ऑर्गनजिंग एट एंड थैंक यू आल अटेंडी फॉर मेकिंग इट हियर सो आई एम लैक्स फ्रॉम इंट्यूट विथ मी आई हैव रवि एंड टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑन रेसिलियंसी पैटर्न ऑन इन कूबर नेटिस सो अजेंडा फॉर टूडे लुक्स लाइक समथिंग लाइक दिस लिटिल बिट हिस्ट्री ऑन इंट्यूट एंड देन वॉट इज मॉडर्न सैस द प्लेटफॉर्म दैट वी बिल्ड फॉर अवर डेवलपर and also why we built it and how do we onboard our micro services on to this platform and you will be interested to know how long it takes so we have a slide for that one and then the meat of the talk is on resiliency which ravi will take you through so as a company it was started on 1983 uh, by our founder when he actually the idea came up on a kitchen table when he was looking at his wife how she is managing the book and then he thought uh, there is a better way to do it so that's where the idea was born our first product was quicken and then of course we went public in 93 uh, we have around close to 8k employees we have uh, uh, multiple location across the globe in 11 countries 24 location and all this 8000 employees are around this place and we have around 42 million customers and uh, these are the different customers that we serve the consumer group which uh, mainly they use our tax product and then small business and self employed and these are our products the turbo tax is for filing tax if you are from us you will be very familiarized with that and we have accounting solution for small business in the form of quickbooks and we have a professional tax solution in the form of pro connect and mint is a personal finance solution so coming back to the main topic on modern sas why we started building this one as you see since we have around 42 million customer the recoverability was something we wanted to always improve on right the recoverability is it's okay to i mean you will end up having some issue some incident always but it's about uh, how quickly we can recover from it so we wanted to improve that number by 10 times so that was one of the goal while we started working on this platform the second one was how fast we can release the code to the production the reason for this is when somebody merges the pr and if it get deployed into the production within a day then it is fresh on the developer mind that what are the changes that he made so in term it actually helps in recovery just in case we identify some bug or some issue so we wanted to have a really really fast release cycle and of course we want to ship all the feature to the customer so we wanted to have a more frequent release of our product so the first thing was we have all, everything as a big monolith product so the first ask was to bring them into or break them into a micro services which many team did it so they broke into micro services and then they started hosting it we mainly use aws as a hosting platform so many team went ahead and then provision the infrastructure on aws provision their uh, i mean come up with their own deployment solution and uh, set up everything on aws but what ended up happening was each team had a different way of slightly different way of setting it up and we end up having multiple aws account the challenge with that was you have to maintain the security across all the account and then you want to have some uniform way of pushing some patches and other stuff so that became our first challenge and second challenge was each team had their own architecture and then if you have to move around people between the team everyone has to learn the new architecture how the new setup is done but the most challenging thing was every developer has to understand how the aws works so there is always a learning curve involved so no sooner they come up with some idea or some product beside working on their own product they have to spend some sufficient amount of time initially to get onboarded on to aws it used to take four or five weeks for them to just onboard into aws and then start working on the platform this when we thought that we should do something so which makes it much easier for the developers that's where we build a uh, platform called the modern saas platform all the developer that he need to do is just come to the platform and request saying that hey i am going to provision a new service on this to platform so he selects whether it's a java based or node based service though we are not limited to these two technologies as long as they can dockerize they can run it on this platform so they come and give their specification or some metadata about their services and then they get their git repo where they can put their code and then we provision something called a deployment repo which i'll talk it in the next slide and besides that they get a, a 
pipeline, Jenkins pipeline to build their artifact and uh, of course in this case artifact is a docker image and then that gets uploaded to uh, JFrog artifactory and it runs on Kubernetes. So with that what we achieved and all it takes is just 15 minutes, right? At the end of 15 minutes you get a microservice which uh, uh, runs in production, not just in pre-prod, it runs in production with all the monitoring tool that we use within Intuit. Whether it's a Wavefront or AppD, those kind of things, it just runs with all the monitoring tool that he needs. And also the security is completely built in. So with that, what we achieved is a higher velocity because the developer can actually focus on the product which they are developing rather than worrying about the infrastructure. So the infrastructure was completely abstracted and the security is actually built into the product. So they really don't have to worry about the security because it comes from a common platform and everything is taken care of within the platform. Next. So after provisioning, what happens? All the developer, one tool that he needs to know about is Git, and which they know really, really well. Right? So he commits the code, then the Jenkins pipeline kicks in, and it uh, runs Maven as a build tool. I mean, you can use any, any of your choice as a build tool. Finally, it converts into a Docker image and uploads into the Artifactory. And once the image is uploaded into Artifactory, so we use something called a deployment repo. That's where the latest version of the artifact gets updated. And then the Orgo CD, which is an open source solution from Intuit, which is used for deploying into the Kubernetes, it picks up the latest version of the code and deploys into the Kubernetes. And all this happens within a few minutes again. So as long as he has a PR which is certified, he can just get into the production pretty quickly. So that's the power of this platform. Of course, there are many tools that make up the platform. Uh, today we will focus more on the Kubernetes, but there are many tools that we use to build the whole platform. And of course, the soft copy is available if anyone wants to use it, but uh, this is a whole uh, suit of thing that we use to make this platform. And uh, <laughs> this is the scale at which we operate. So we have four business units, and of course there are multiple segments. There are around 1,200 developers. We have total around 4,500, but at least 1,200 developers as of today are using this platform. And out of uh, all the services we have, 36% of the service runs on this platform. And uh, all these things we started a year ago. Last January we started, and then onwards, uh, the people started migrating to the new platform. We have around 160 clusters and uh, 6K nodes, more than uh, 5,400 namespaces, and a massive number of pods, 62K pods. And, uh, Every day we have around 1,300 deployment, and it is still growing. So our aim is to make all the services within Intuit run on this platform. So still long way to go, 64%. But based on the adoption, pretty soon we will achieve that number. With that said, since we are running it as a massive scale, the problems also plenty. There are many challenges that we faced, and of course we have solution for that one. But one of the thing that we are going to talk about is uh, with respect to the resiliency and with respect to the specific problem but some of our application faced in terms of some client end up having 500 errors. And to take you through that one, Ravi will do it. So we see uh, how the scale at which we are operating. Uh, one of the things I've uh, uh, seen is that uh, no matter how good we design an application, system gets what it wants by throwing challenges at us. So. These are the challenges that we have run into predominantly in Kubernetes platform, which is pod termination and no termination. So our clients used to see 502 errors whenever there was a pod termination event, and they used to see 504 error code on their HTTP client when there is a no termination event that happens. So before getting into the details of the termination lifecycle, et cetera, let's understand the request flow. So when a client sends a request, we use API Gateway in Intuit. So API Gateway forwards the request to the ALB ingress, ALB ingress then forwards the request on the node port on any of the node that is registered as a target in the ALB targets. From there, the node port will look up into the IP tables of the node and then resolve it to the appropriate pod and forwards the request to the corresponding uh, pod. Now let's look at the pod termination lifecycle, right? So whenever uh, a Kubernetes deletes a pod or we delete a pod, which is a natural event in the Kubernetes platform, API server does a couple of operations in parallel. One, it sends a notification to endpoint controller. Endpoint controller then removes the pod from the endpoints and then updates back the API server. API server then forwards a notification to the kube proxy. 
QProxy is run per node. So QProxies uh, get the notification and they remove the pod entry from their IP tables. While this is happening across the nodes, another parallel event uh, will, will happen. The API server will send the notification to Kubelet. Kubelet then understands that pod needs to be terminated that is running in its node. So it sends a system signal to the pod and correspondingly to the containers running in the pod. So for a 502 error on the HTTP ha happens when the system signal is not handled gracefully in the application pod. It may also happen that when the pod is removed from the IP tables, we still see some keep alive connections from ALB to the pod because the connections once established, they live long until the keep alive timeout, which is by default the 60 seconds. So let's understand what happens specifically when the system signal is received by the container. A container shutdown is initiated, and then if we configure a pre-stop hook in our pod spec, the pre-stop hook process is executed, and then the system signal is sent to the process. And then the process termination starts. If the process is able to terminate within the termination grace period seconds, which is by default 30 seconds, you know it will uh, terminate the process successfully. If not, Kubelet will send a sick kill, which is force killing the pod, uh, and then it will delete the pod and the container running in it. So we need to handle our 502 error case by handling the pre-stop hook carefully and then uh, gracefully. So when the system signal is reached to the pod, we need to wait in the pre-stop hook until the pod IP is removed across all the nodes such that the no new requests will be sent to the pod. After that event happens, if we are using HTTP keep alive connections, ALB maintains a keep alive connection to the pod. So when the system signal is received by the application process, it has to handle that shutdown event carefully by closing all the inactive keep alive connections. And if there are connections that are in transit, it has to process them. And then while serving the request back, it has to pass a connection close header or close the connection in any other way so that we can proceed for terminating the process gracefully. If we handle in such a fashion, we will never see a 502 error on the client side. So this is an uh, example pod spec, which is the easiest one where we can configure pre-stop hook to wait for, say, sleep 60 seconds. And then termination grace period seconds, by default, is 30 seconds. If we are increasing the sleep time or any other uh, process that we are doing in the pre-stop hook, we need to correspondingly increase the termination grace period seconds. This is one event. The other thing that we have noticed at the infrastructure level is that the node termination. And no termination can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, a cloud provider may be doing availability zone rebalancing, or an autoscaler is scaling in the nodes to maximize their resource utilization, so it may terminate the node. So 504 error predominantly happens when ALB doesn't respond back to the client in time, that is, uh, the timeout configured on the client side. And ALB may also throw a 504 error when ALB sends the request to the pod, and the pod doesn't respond back in time, that is, ALB timeout. Now, there is one more use case when this 504 error can happen. When the nodes are terminated, ALB, ALB has the node in its target group, but the node is terminated and it will not be able to make a connection to the node. So if we, if we run Kubernetes in any of the cloud provider, example, we use KOps to run Kubernetes cluster in AWS. The cloud provider is not aware of the infrastructure of Kubernetes that we are running on top of it. So when a terminate instance event happens, it will go and terminate the instance right away. But it doesn't guarantee that it will drain the node how Kubernetes wants it, nor it doesn't deregister the node from the ALB. Those are the events that we need to handle. In order to be able to handle that, we, we should not directly use the easy to terminate instances function. But when the terminate instance happens, we need to trigger it through terminate instance in auto scaling group. The advantage with that is the terminate instance auto scaling group provides lifecycle hooks. So we introduce a project called Lifecycle Manager under the Kiko open source project. Lifecycle hook, hooks provide extreme powerful ability to do EC2 terminations synchronously. Lifecycle Manager will intercept such hooks and post an event in the SQS notification engine, and then we pick up the notification and then drain the node as well as drain the target from the ALB, and then further proceed for the node termination, which is a graceful event. 
Now, these are the two pictures where the first one talks about before implementing the lifecycle manager, if you see the lines that are in the slanting uh, side, where uh, the, they are in red color, those are the events that we were seeing with the 504 errors when we were running without lifecycle manager and without leveraging the lifecycle hooks. But after implementing it, we have never seen a 504 error in our cluster lifecycle. So lifecycle manager fits into the reliability component of Kiko project. There are other other, other components in the Kiko that you can uh, see, like for security, orchestration, monitoring, cost efficiency, uh, please feel free to contribute if you like this project. So conclusions, in order to be able to uh, be resilient, we need to leverage pre-stop hooks and wait for the pod IP to be removed from the IP tables so that we'll not receive any new traffic onto the pod. After that, when we send the SIGTERM signal to the pod, it has to be handled gracefully so that it deletes all the keep alive connections. The next thing is on the node termination, we need to use terminate instance in the auto scaling group kind of functions, which provide an ability to send a notification event and pause the termination of the EC2 instances. And then we need to leverage these lifecycle hooks to drain the nodes and drain the ALB or ELB targets. Uh, before going to the questions, I wanted to say one statement that Kubernetes definitely provides recoverability, but resiliency is something that we need to handle, and uh, we should aim for achieving that. Thank you. Any questions? OK. So Showing up. Well, we showed a slide on Kiko project. Feel free to go and contribute it. There are many components that we built to address different challenges. Resiliency is one such thing we talked about. So there are many components that we used and then we open sourced it. Please feel free to use it. Feel free to contribute it. Thank you. Thank you.